Hey, good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you at the, from the Dahl Simons Family Studio. Delighted to be back with you at this first of our new year. What a great time to be here because so many good things are going to happen over the next year as we begin to really beat COVID. This year is going to start off pretty cool for me today on a personal level as I get my COVID-19 vaccination. I'm up. It's my turn. I am uh, involved in the care of patients still. I see patients in our ambulatory practice as well as do inpatient rounding. And uh, based upon our, the way we've been doing the vaccination, all our front line folks like Hawkeye, who's much more frontline than I am, and the ICU doctors, the floor folks, and the nursing staff, and the environmental services staff directly involved in the care of COVID-19 patients have been vaccinated. And now it's my turn. So we're going to get to see me on the air with my T-shirt on, Hawkeye. It won't be quite as cool as what you do, but I, 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 I'm going to. I'm going to rock it today. I got an outdoor vest to show you, know, Mr. Yeah. Outdoor Guy. I should have worn my fly time. fishing vest. One of our great team members here said, "Hey, how come you bring your fly yeah. fish?" I, if I thought about that, I would have done that. Yeah. That would have been really cool. Second dose. I know. Second dose. That's yep. a great point. I will. I will do just that. All right, so we have a pretty cool program to start with today, though. Kevin Alt, who is an OBGYN physician here at our health system and a member of the CDC Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, will be, is joining us, along with Dr. Angela Myers, who's been with us before. Welcome back. Our, the Division Director of Infectious Disease at Children's Mercy Hospital. We're going to talk about vaccines and update the story today about the multi-system inflammatory syndrome being seen in children. But first, Hawkeye, mm -hmm. it's a new year. Mm -hmm. How are we doing? You know, a year ago, we were kind of just hearing the rumblings about really what was going on, you know, across the ocean, and now look where we're at. Um, currently, you know, last week we had pretty good numbers. We were down to actually we 52 I acute know, we got infections. That. And we were pretty, that was pretty cool. That was pretty happy. Yeah. Um, since that time, though, I would say we are less happy, less optimistic. The numbers have gone up. We have 70 acute infections right now with 28 in the ICU and 15 of those on the vent, so a pretty high proportion on the vent. We still have 56 people in that kind of recovery phase with seven of those that are remaining on the vent as well. You know, luckily, Hayes, as far as, because we understand their capacity, their numbers are down. They have 23 uh, infections with 16 active and seven in that recovery period. But, but here, for, for our increases, uh, like it has been from 52, you know, at their recent low, 70 now that that's kind of concerning are we concerned that that is a post christmas are we beginning to see the surge i think it's somewhere in between um thanksgiving and christmas yeah you know certainly i was working uh, uh at the end of the week last week on new year's eve day and new year's day and actually did see a patient who was at a christmas gathering uh with people with a bunch of family um you know probably 15 to 20 people um Everybody felt fine, but a couple days later, somebody got COVID, and so now this patient is in the hospital because of that gathering. So we know it's happening. It's going out there. We know that you can have the disease and spread it without knowing that you have symptoms uh, one to two days before symptoms at least, uh, but even in, in those otherwise who are totally asymptomatic patients, you can spread the disease, and this is what happens. Yeah, and that's a, that's a big deal. And so everybody just needs to remember, please try not to gather in those groups. Make sure you yeah. keep wearing the mask. Even as we get vaccination, your defensive strategy is as important as your offensive strategy. Mm -hmm. It's a team game. If we're going to win, we got to play both sides of the ball here. Well, I think I'm, uh, I think I'm ready for my COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, so I'm going to introduce through James. But first, I have to put my mask on. So I've got my mask up KU right here. Put my mask on because we want to be safe as we officially do this. Two is one of our outstanding assistant nursing directors. And Hawk and I wanted to get our shots during the update to literally show you what to expect so that you'll answer your call to arms. So I'm going to take my coat off here and get ready. Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. I knew I was going to do this. Just one second. Hawk, <laughs> I talk about the numbers for a minute while I get confused with my mask and my, uh, my earpiece. Yeah, you know, um, we were certainly happy. You know, we understand that in holiday or special occasions, that uh, the surges aren't two weeks later or three weeks later. We saw that with the original uh, surging after the shutdown or the stay-at-home orders, and that was with Memorial Day. After that, it didn't happen in two weeks or three weeks, but it was four, five, six weeks down the road because it does have to get to those second and third line of infections. Plus, it does take time to get to that point where you need to be hospitalized. Some people are hospitalized in the acute setting because they have fever and just feel bad. But it's really that uh, 10, 12, 14 days after the initial infection when you have that 
inflammatory response that is going on that causes a lot of those lung infiltrates, uh, that pneumonia that you may see from COVID and the, the lack of getting adequate oxygen to your tissues when people are coming to the hospital. And then of course we know that deaths can lag behind hospitalizations by even two weeks as well. So, so we are just seeing a lag. It's nothing that we're gonna know um, one or two days afterward. It is a week process, a week by week. And the only way we can really know is by looking back retrospectively on what the full impact of that was. Yeah, so important. Okay, well, here we go. I'm about ready to get my shot here in the air. Now, too, I do have a question for you. Yes. You and I have known each other for a long time, right? Yes. Yes, and we're not going to tell everybody how long. <laughs> but there's no vendetta here, right? This is just, you're not, you're not out to get me. Not at all. Okay, awesome. It's my pleasure. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, pleasure. That's all right. right. Let's do it. All right, Dr. Stites, heart, you don't feel sick at all today, do you? I don't. Okay, do you have any allergic reaction in the past to no, the vaccination? I not. Okay. I'm, I'm actually going... pretty excited to get this vaccine. Great. Yeah. I'm going to be giving you Moderna today. Okay. So please keep this card in a I'll safe place and yep. bring it with you um, for your next, your second dose. Thank you. And that's four weeks away from now. That is correct. All right, there you go. Yep. And I think we should be getting our second dose of Pfizer this week. So we will start giving it to our employees that had their That's first right. dose. right, we are on our second dose yeah. as a Pfizer already. So there you go, here it is, folks. And uh, just to say, I'm 60 years old. I do have a couple, couple of risk factors around this, but my the way we did this, my it's my turn just based yeah. upon our system of moving through um, uh, all practices of people who are seeing patients. So I think that's our approach. You ready? Yes, ma'am, I'm ready, let's do it. And as soon as we are able to give it to our other um, final employees and our patients and yeah. start vaccinating the public, we are going to be able to do that. Yeah, we're going to, that's exciting. We're there you go. Things. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. We'll, we'll schedule for your appointment right. around February. We've got our call to arms. There we that's go. Right. You right. had your arm. We got my arm. We got a lot more arms. <laughs> exactly. Good, exactly. That's awesome. My arm is still here. It didn't fall off. <laughs> it so. did. You haven't passed out yet. I have. As far as she, I know. She also didn't give you a warning on a on a stick and a poke either. Oh, she did. She did. She said, "Are you oh, ready?" Yeah. So I knew <laughs> that was coming. All right. So we can take our masks off now. So we're going to take those off. Yeah. I'm going to pull, pull this out of my ear again. All right, so there's a 15 minute observation period and that's done because this is a relatively new vaccine, Hawk, and, and we need to make sure that people are okay after they get the vaccine, right? Yep, yep, absolutely. And we, we know that these monitoring periods are nothing new. We do it with shingles vaccine, we do it with HPV vaccine. So um, it's just part of standard protocol, not for every vaccine, but certainly for some, and especially with this because it is so new. All right, well, let's see before we go any further, too. I know we have to wait 15 minutes, and you have to come back and check on me. Yes. But before that, let's see if there are any reporter questions out there. Happy New Year. Cody Holyoke from Channel 9. Cody. Hi, Cody. How are you guys? Um, we saw the headlines overnight about the U.S. looking at the Moderna vaccine and saying, hey, we might be able to do half the dose to try to spread out the supply. Mm. I was curious about your, your thoughts on this, and you're much more read up on it than, than we are. Um, did the studies, the trials, look at that possibility? Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a couple of experts. So first, let me turn to Hawkeye, and then we're going to introduce our panel a little yeah. more because we've got to ask them to pull them into that question. Yeah. Go ahead, Hawkeye. You know, I am not privy to that information. We know that they did look at different doses. Um, they have those out there on the FDA briefs, and they looked at those doses in those initial studies to see what the response was. Um, so I'll start there and then let our, uh, our experts talk. Dr. Alt, you were on the CDC advisory panel. Talk to us a little bit about that and what your thoughts are around the half dose. Well, I'll just expand on what Dr. Hawkinson just said. <clears throat> the phase one and the phase two studies are usually dose finding exercises, and so there were different doses, but the emergency use authorization and the ACIP recommendations, the committee that you mentioned that I'm on, are based on the phase three data, which was fixed dose versus placebo, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about reduced dosing and one dose and that kind of thing. You know, speaking for myself, I think that makes me a little nervous because we don't have data about that. Um, you, you know, there are 14 of us on the ACIP and there's a lot of different backgrounds, plus there's a couple of dozen liaisons and this would be the kind of issue we would talk out and we didn't really talk about this because the last time we met two weeks ago, not sure people were thinking about this that much. So, uh, you know, it makes me a little nervous and I would like to see some data basically. Yeah. 
Yeah, I would think that's that's exactly right. Dr. Myers, any other thoughts around that as well? No, I, I agree with what's been said so far. What we know is that there is an antibody response to the first dose of vaccine, but the best antibody response comes after the second dose. And so I agree that we really don't know what would happen if we immunized everybody with one dose and delayed that second dose. You know, the other thought, I, I read that as well, and I didn't really dig into the Moderna data, although it was published recently in the New England Journal of yeah. Medicine. It came out yeah. on December 31st, just to say, if you anybody really wanted to go see it, you can. It's free and open to the public. But the, uh, and a good article to read. Mm -hmm. But the uh, other thought is, right now, our problem isn't number of doses. We're still lagging behind getting the doses into arms. So yeah. we really need to work us on, on work on our logistics aspect, as well as thinking about having the dose. Thoughts about that? You know, I totally agree. I think initially here we had our systems in place, but it takes a, a little bit to ramp up. We are, I think, pretty ru running pretty efficiently now at the build ability to get a large number of employees vaccinated. And like I said, we are working now on those systems for mass vaccinations for the public when they are available to the public as well. So we've kind of moved out that. We have, I think, really good protocols and systems in place for our employees in general. Um, but it is going to be the key is really getting um, access for the general population for those vaccines. Yeah, and it is to say it's been an outstanding partnership between the health system and university because mm -hmm. the health system is going to do uh, some mass immunization clinics. We're going to do them over in the university and, yeah. and because they have some space in the new health education building. So I think that's going to be a great partnership and help us to get a lot of people vaccinated, beginning with our own teams here and moving on to healthcare workers and first responders before mm -hmm. we move down the list and, and things. So I think we're, we're excited about that opportunity. Questions, uh, other questions out there? Yeah, this is, yeah, this is Ellen McNamara from KCTV5. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year, Ellen. Happy New Year. Yeah, so you actually kind of touched a little bit. This, that's going to lead me into my question. Um, and we reported last week that the state of Kansas is dead last in the country right now for getting the vaccine out into people's arms. And um, so Senator Romney had blasted the government on the holidays and said that part of the problem is the United States is asking health systems that, you know, are so overwhelmed right now to tackle the job of, of getting the vaccine out. And he had suggested that maybe even veterinarians, medical students, so you were talking about medical schools, get involved in distribution. Um, is there anything that, so first off, does it surprise you that Kansas is dead last right now in the country? And then is there anything just that you think could possibly be done to, to get this out into more arms across the state? Yeah, that's a great question, and and one that's perhaps a little bit out of some of our pathways because mm -hmm. we don't usually take yeah. on some of that. But but let, 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 let's let's say this about it. When the first thing we have to do, and I think the ramp up is going to be a little slow as we get the full system in place. What will help all immunization centers is to know how much vaccine you're going to get, the date and the schedule you're going to get it, so you can plan and scale up for that. But make no mistake, this will take all of us to do that, whether it's the CVS and Walgreens pharmacies, which, by the way, remember what they've done in nursing homes, um, whether it's your, your, your uh, primary care office, whether it's hospitals and health systems. We need to put as much out there as we can because we have to have a call to arms. If we are going to be able to tackle this novel coronavirus effectively, it will require a call to arms. And I mean that both in the figurative and the literal sense, because that's what's going to help us get the vaccine into people and get it in their arms so we can get people protected. But I think it's just taking us a while to get through those logistics in order to know how much we're going to have, when we're going to have it, and then understanding exactly who we want to give it to, Hawkeye. Yeah, you know, I, I think, again, we want to definitely stay with what we're, uh, you know, in our lane with the medical aspect of it. Um, I think it does take time. I think some of that also uh, is the ability to have it in the cold storage initially for Pfizer. I mean, there are just little missteps, but I think overall it's, it is getting better, and it should continue to get better. And we also are working with um, with our partners out west in western Kansas to help get them that as well. So. There is a lot of help, um, but I think it, it does take time. Uh, but I think it has improved since day one and will continue to improve as well. Yeah, and I think one of the challenges, Kansas is such a rural state. You have a lot of territory to yeah. cover. And you also have, um, I think, a situation in which we just, it, I think when two weeks will look a lot different than we do right now. I don't, Dr. Alds or Dr. Myers, any other thought about that? 
Well, we talked about this quite a bit at the ACIP meeting that was the weekend before the holidays, the 17th and 18th, I believe, were the dates. And um, there were some very impassioned pleas from the public health people. I remember Jeff Dushin in particular as a public health official for Kings County in Washington, you know, said we put a lot of money into developing the vaccine. We put very little money in figuring out how to deliver the vaccine. And so, uh, you know, that's where the bottleneck is. Uh, as you said, however, you know, we've not really tried anything like this in American history. A couple of times I've mentioned the polio campaigns in the mid 1950s. Um, you know, the, I remember getting the sugar cube, the oral polio vaccine in elementary school, and I think mm -hmm. you might too. Uh, yeah, you know, those are an entirely <laughs> different audience uh, back then. So, uh, you know, having a group of school kids that are all in school at one time, we went to the gym to get it, uh, is a lot different than what we're trying to do now. Yeah, McCoy Elementary School, Independence, Missouri, remember it well. Yes, indeed, out in the gym or in the classroom, getting the polio vaccine on a sugar cube. But uh, this is a little different in the arm. But I think I think it is just going to take, I think the point of, gosh, we just put all this thing into warp speed with trying to develop the vaccine. Now we're really going to have to focus on logistics of getting the vaccine. And, you know, it, the evidence is what the evidence is. We, we haven't gotten as much in as we need to, but we'll, we're going to get there. But that wouldn't be inconsistent with what has been... Um, you know, observed for the right. past year, which is a very uh, little infrastructure to the public health. I mean, th that is one of the other things that has been exposed this past year is the infrastructure in general and specifically the infrastructure for public health as well. So yeah. hopefully this is another call to arms for that. And, and recognizing and exposing that and then making changes moving forward. Yeah, I think we have to learn from this event and, and understand that our ability to affect public health and to deliver that for things like this is something we need to work on as a country in order to make sure we, we, uh, we protect each other yeah. well. So, other questions? Okay, not hearing any. Let me first turn to uh, Kevin Alt, uh, uh, to Dr. Alt. So thoughts about things, about how we're doing overall and where you see things going and your work with the CDC Advisory Committee. Well, I was watching the news this morning and the data that was being shown on Good Morning America was that we had 4 million doses given out so far. The goal for Operation Warp Seed was 20 million by the end of the year, so we obviously missed that. There are some other vaccines on the horizon, and some of them are being used internationally. So as far as supply goes, you know, crystal balls have been in short supply for the last 12 months. But as far as supply goes, you would think it would be better over the next few uh, months, especially if we get more, more different types of vaccines available with different handling characteristics and might be able to be given in doctor's offices and that type of thing. So, so yeah, it's, it's going to be very hard to predict the future. I usually start off by saying, you know, about 50% of what I say about COVID is going to be wrong, maybe even in a week. And so, you know, but as far as what's going on in the big picture, it looks like the supply will loosen up considerably these first few months of this new year. Yeah, what do, you, what do you think of the future of the AstraZeneca vaccine in the United States? Any any insight about that? Well, you, you know, the, they still have to go through all the processes at the at FDA, and it seems like the timing has been, um, you, you know, the company announces that we're ready to submit to the FDA. A week or two goes by, the FDA works triple overtime and, and has a public hearing, and then we have an emergency ACIP meeting. The FDA is the person that issues the immediate emergency use authorization, then the advisor committee on immunization practices comes in and makes some clinical recommendations. So, you, you know, that we will probably have more safety data on that vaccine because it is being used uh, in the United Kingdom and some other places. So, uh, so, yeah, I mean, more vaccine would definitely help the crunch we're having. You know, I think last time we talked, you know, there are 20 million healthcare workers 3 million people in long-term ter care facilities and then 100 million mm -hmm. essential workers, you know, that's a lot, that's a lot of vaccine, you know, that's half of the, you know, two third or one third of the country, right. basically in that first phase one. Yeah, it's so important. So talk to us a little bit, you know, one of the questions we get on the program a lot, Dr. Alton, we've, we're happy you're here today to help us answer this, is what about expectant moms? Should they be getting the vaccine? Should, is, it, is it safe to breastfeed after the, uh, after the vaccine? How does that, how does that look? 
Well, let, let's separate pregnancy and breastfeeding, and our, our other colleague from Children's can help with the breastfeeding question a little bit. You know, it's hard to imagine a mechanism where a vaccine goes in the arm and, and causes harm to a newborn. You know, there's lipases and RNA breakdown enzymes and, you know, in the arm and the maternal circulation, the breast and the child's stomach. So I, I'm not that worried about breastfeeding mothers. I, I think the only thing, if anybody's listening in who is breastfeeding, you know, if you get a fever or another reaction, your breast milk supply might be down for a day or two. But I, that, that group, I'm not that worried about. I think we had a consensus when we talked about this at ACIP. For pregnancy, of course, we don't really have a lot of data. Uh, we have a few people that got pregnant during the trials of the two vaccines that are available for emergency use authorization. So, so we're very handicapped as far as what to tell people. There's not an a priori reason to think a, a vaccine that's not a live virus would cause problems during pregnancy. The, the real problem we have out of those 20 million healthcare workers is about 330,000 are going to be pregnant or breastfeeding, and many of them are frontline uh, providers, you know, healthcare workers. And so, uh, you, you know, and pregnancy is at risk for more severe disease. So what ACIP and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists have recommended is to, is to realize that there's not much data, talk to your obstetrician, try to evaluate what's going on in your community, and try to see what your own exposure is. So several factors go into that decision. We might have data pretty quickly because of the VSAFE uh, program. Our next regularly scheduled ACIP meeting is in February. The VSAFE is a CDC vaccine safety program, and you're going to get a text later today to sign up for that, I hope, if you didn't sign up right there live while I was talking. Uh, I will be signing up. Okay. Yep. So, I yeah, I mean, that's 500 pregnant women signed up the very first week for that uh, for that program. So, you know, that's 20 times what we were in the trials. So, so yeah, we should have data relatively quickly and hopefully there'll be no problems. And, and to be clear, I'm not pregnant, so I won't be able to participate in that part of it, but I can mm. certainly participate in <laughs> the other parts of it. So, so, hey, listen, have we had moms who are um, COVID positive to deliver at the hospital? How have they done? How are the babies doing? We, we seem to have lots of those moms. Yes, that's why I was first in line for the vaccine ahead of you guys. I got mine two weeks ago. Uh, you, you know, I would guess 10 or 20 percent. There's a registry that we're sending, you know, our, our cases to at the University of California. You, you know, most people do fine. I mean, pregnant women, one of the nice things about being an obstetrician is pregnant women are young and healthy and usually tolerate, you know, pneumonia and heart disease and those kind of things during pregnancy relatively well. However, you know, locally and nationally, we've seen some very severe cases and there have been several on the sixth floor, you know, of our hospital that have been very ill, some transfers. So, uh, you know, I, I'm just surprised we screen everybody when they come to labor delivery. And I would guess we're running about 10 or 20%, uh, you know, positive rate. I, I haven't been on labor delivery since before since before the holidays, so I don't know if it's gone up or down, but that's kind of been my impression for the last month. All right. Well, I think my time's up. I think I'm going to have my follow-up with two James. Two, how am I doing so far? You look great. How do you feel? I feel good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And have you... I got to have my signature right yes. here, all right? Hey, two, could you go around on the other side? Oh. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. I have to put my mask on. I forgot. Wait a second. <laughs> I'm out. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe I did that. There we go. Okay. okay, my mask is back on. Great. Yep, I've got my signature. I feel good. Wonderful. My, my, my arm hasn't fallen off yet. I'm not sure. I don't think I don't think he really stabbed me or anything. Kind of... <laughs> okay, so your next appointment will be. Yes, ma'am. Around February the first, okay. and then we'll get a date and a time for you. All right. All right. Hey, thanks for All coming right. down. I Thank appreciate you for being here. We'll appreciate see ya. the great work you've done thanks. at KU for so yeah. many years too. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Much. Too. You guys don't know, she's been one of our best nurse managers on the floor. She worked with oncology. She works in the cancer program. We turn to her a lot, and today she's even given shots, so thank you. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to turn to Dr. Angela Myers. Angela, man, more community spread out there, and I've heard before that you guys are seeing some more of the multisystem inflammatory syndrome in kids. How are things at Children's? How are things going? Yeah, we are seeing more multi-system multi inflammatory syndrome in kids. Um, 
it really does mirror what the CDC is reporting, what's happening nationwide. We saw an increase in COVID cases starting around Halloween through November and through Thanksgiving and even into December, which makes sense that there would then be a resultant increase in, in Miss C because it generally occurs two to four weeks after having had COVID infection. I go back on, so you have to talk longer. Um, so <laughs> I'm back, and you were you're, you, have, you're, you, do, you gave a great answer though. So at Children's, what, what concerns you most about the syndrome, and does it generally go away? What kind of therapies do you use for it? Well, you know, there's really no long-term data, and the therapies that we use include immunoglobulins and steroids, and then sometimes immunomodulating agents like anakinra. A multi-specialty team is always involved with all of these kids, including rheumatology and infectious diseases and cardiology, the ICU doctors if the patient is sick enough to be in the ICU, and the hospital medicine doctors if the patient is you know, well enough to be on the floor. Um, so it's a multidisciplinary team that really kind of makes decisions in real time um, what to do for each individual patient. And um, there's data being collected. There are three different studies ongoing at Children's Mercy um, collecting data on these kids. One is a long-term um, cardiac outcome study where we're participating in a national registry of MIS-C. And we're just now getting started on a, another program that will compare diagnosis and management of children with COVID-19, so acute COVID-19 infection versus Kawasaki disease versus MIS-C. And you know, there, there's some overlap between Kawasaki and MIS-C. And so this um, particular study will be really good to help us look at that and understand the differences a little bit better and what the best diagnostic methods and treatment methods uh, will be moving forward. So important. Are you seeing a lot of heart and lung complications long-term in kids so far? What we would construed to be long-term since I guess it's only been a few months really, but um, what do you think about that? Yeah, we've not seen a lot of long-term heart complications. Uh, we have seen some coronary artery um, dilations and even some aneurysms that will be continued to be followed long-term, but for the most part, kids recover from their MIS-C and do pretty well. Have we had any deaths in kids from COVID-19 or from MIS-C? We have not, but there have been nationally. So there's been, as of December 4th, the CDC reported around 1,300 cases with 30 deaths. Their data will be updated this Friday. It's um, updated the first Friday of the month. So it'll be interesting to see what's happened. If uh, what's happening nationally is what we've been seeing here in Kansas City with an increase in cases over the last month or so. And, um, and, and we'll have a little bit more information from that. Okay, so schools are probably going to start going back pretty soon. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about the safety of schools and, and the safety of kids at schools and the safety of the families who have the kids at school? Talk to us a little bit about that. You guys have been intimately involved with school districts and have done a great job working so hard with them. Well, thank you. You know, I'm glad you asked me that. A new paper came out in the MMWR in mid-December, and it was a study, it was a case control study that was conducted in Mississippi with the Mississippi Department of Health. And they, they, they followed 400 kids, um, one, one third cases, one third controls from acute COVID infection. And they looked at a number of different things. And what they found was that primarily the kids who were infected from COVID were, were related to gatherings, weddings, funerals, parties, play dates, things like that, but not related to being in school when schools were using appropriate PPE, you know, or masks, when schools were using the appropriate protections, right? Distancing and masks. And so that data is really helpful. So kids who went to gatherings, who were doing play dates, who were doing big social, social events, they were two to three times as likely to get COVID than kids who were not doing those, than kids who did not have COVID infection, but they did not see an increase in COVID infection because of attending school or child care centers. So I think that that data really helps us to understand that transmission really isn't happening in schools. There's another study from the UK that found the very same thing. They are also not seeing transmission in schools when the schools are taking appropriate measures. So, so the rules of infection control travel with you wherever you yeah. go, whether you're at work, whether you're in school. Mm -hmm. We saw the same thing at KU, right? Yep. I mean, the, the infection rate at KU was actually lower than it was in the community 
because the kids were distancing, doing the things they were supposed to do. And I think it just makes, again, it makes all the difference. If you follow the rules, you can stay safe. When you don't follow the rules is when danger, danger comes aboard. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for that. And I so appreciate the great work you guys have done. You know, we hear from a lot of our county folks and yeah. uh, both sides of the state line. We know children have been intimately involved with a lot of the school districts. So thanks so much for doing that great work. All right, Jill, let's see what questions are out there. Oh, my goodness. Mm. I bet lots there are a few. Lots. Yes, all right. We're going to start with Cindy uh, because it's kind of on topic. She has a two-part question. One of them is that the newborns that are born to moms that are COVID positive, are those newborns tested and do they have COVID? And the second question is, in light of Joe Ellen Engelbart, who was the Jackson County prosecutor who uh, died over the weekend mm -hmm. of COVID-related yeah. after giving birth, how is that impacting the advice that Dr. Alt is giving his moms that might be thinking about birth plans and that kind of thing? Should you, you conceive during a pandemic? Should you conceive during a pandemic? Okay, Dr. Alt, I'm going to start with you. We're going to let every one of our panelists swing at that one because that, that's sort of, I mean, that's just a great question, well-framed and has a lot of personal, personal issues associated with that because of what's just happened. Yeah, I mean, we're, you just said infection control follows you everywhere. That's certainly the advice we're giving to pregnant women. Uh, as far as the risk of, of pulmonary complications in pregnancy, we know with influenza that it's the last two or three months of pregnancy, the third trimester and the first few months postpartum are the most vulnerable times. So when the heart is really stressed in late pregnancy, heart and lungs, and before it can get back, to normal, uh, you know, the first few weeks postpartum. We know that from influenza data, and we've known that for a long time. Uh, you know, whatever you can do as far as social isolation, distancing, getting your flu shot while you're pregnant to avoid other respiratory infections are all things that we tell our patients to do. Uh, as far as conceiving during a pandemic, you know, we get that uh, question pretty frequently. Some of the data would say that women with underlying health conditions like hypertension and obesity are mo most at risk, and we would like those women to come in anyway for a you know a, a preconception visit. So yes, that's something you should be discussing with your obstetrician, and, and something you should uh, think about. So I, maybe I should let Dr. Meyer. I started to ask Dr. Myers a question during the last <laughs> session. Maybe I should let her talk about newborns, but I have not seen uh, newborns, any data that indicates newborns get ill from COVID. So most hospitals that I know of aren't isolating uh, babies from their mothers for the obvious benefit that babies mm -hmm. get the first few days of life from being with their mothers. Yeah, thoughts about that? I know we started a lot way, but when we first started the pandemic, we didn't know. I think we've relaxed all that, Dr. Meyer. So thoughts about uh, the, the risk to baby from a COVID positive mom? Yeah, we have not had any infections um, occurring either congenitally or postnatally um, from infected moms um, in our in our NICU or our nursery. So I wouldn't, you know, obviously moms need to continue to to practice infection control and wash hands and wear a mask when holding their brand new baby. But um, but they should certainly be around their baby, hold their baby, breastfeed their baby. Um, that we know that breast milk is best for babies, and that that's. Um, that bonding is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Hawk, thoughts that you have as well? No, that was all well they said. said it well. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, next question. Yeah, Jeannie says, some of our friends have had COVID. They say now they can't give COVID to anyone, they can't get it, don't need to wear a mask or social distance. Mm -hmm. Are my friends right? I would say the answer to that is you flunked. Yeah. Hawk, <laughs> correct. No, that is not correct. Uh, that is not right. Your friends are not right. Um, even after having COVID, you do have, there is a 90 day window when you may be immune from getting it again, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're immune from giving it to other people. And we have seen well-documented cases of reinfection at 60 days uh, in that 60 to 90 day window as well. And remember now there is a lot of, a lot more information about that new variant that has been found in different countries, uh, which possibly can be anywhere from 10 to 20 to up to 70% more transmissible. Again, we are still waiting for a lot of data on that. Clinically, it doesn't look that it has changed the severity of the disease, but if it is more transmissible, that's what makes uh, following all those pillars 
ever more important, and that is masking, distancing, not meeting in large gatherings. If we're talking about schools, then it's de-densifying as well. So you have to continue to do all those things that we have been talking about. The pillars of infection control yep. follow it, you wherever you go. Whether you've had COVID or not doesn't mean that you can relax because you still don't want to infect others. And the idea that you can't transmit it to others is not founded in science. It's founded in the Internet. Dangerous mm -hmm. place to start making medical decisions from. Myth busting continues with Linda. All right. Two parters. One, I heard over the weekend that vaccine alters your DNA. Mm. I also heard mm -hmm. that it's made mm. from fetal material. Mm. Oh, we keep wow. getting this fetal question. Okay, well, Dr. Yeah. Alt, yeah. does the vaccine alter your DNA? No and no are the answers to those questions. So I, I think last time I was on, I said I need one of the first or second year medical students to follow me around and remind me of these pathways. But you go from DNA to messenger RNA to protein, you know, retroviruses go backwards, but humans aren't retroviruses. So I think it's the simplest way. We don't have the me mechanism to go from RNA to DNA in our, in our, in our genome. Uh, and know that the RNA that's in the vaccine is, is manufactured. It's chemically uh, made uh, bases. And that, again, that's chemistry that I learned a long time ago mm -hmm. and maybe have forgotten a lot of, but, you know, ask your friendly neighborhood uh, medical student or college student that's taken biology <laughs> for that information. Dr. Myers, uh, from your standpoint, any fetal tissue looking in the, uh, lurking around in those vaccines? No, there's no fetal tissue in these vaccines. In fact, the vaccines have very little in them at all. They've got a lipid nanolayer in the, the mRNA that Dr. Alt was referring to, which, by the way, doesn't even go into the nucleus of the cell. It stays in the cytoplasm, makes the protein, and then gets broken down. So there's no possible way it can get incorporated into your DNA or alter your DNA in any way. Hey, just so our audience knows that the DNA sits inside the nucleus of a cell, mm -hmm. and then the machinery of making the cell work sits in what's called the cytoplasm, which surrounds that, that nucleus. And then there's a membrane to keep it all together that goes around the cell. In this case, which I think we're saying is that the yeah. vaccine pieces, Hawk, get into that part of the cell where the machinery sits, but yeah. never gets into the brain of the cell, the nucleus. Yeah, correct. This modified RNA gets into the, the cytoplasm of the cell because of, of uh, its uptake after the injection, but it does not make it into the nucleus. And again, the nucleus is where the DNA, the chromosomes are. There's no incorporation into your DNA or chromosomes. There's no microchips. Some of the cell lines initially, uh, when uh, doing the experiments and working on these vaccines, were uh, from some aborted fetal tissue uh, but we have seen that there have been statements from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and the Vatican itself saying you are so far removed from that. Um, you are not contributing to that, uh, that crime or that action. You should take the vaccine if you are otherwise able to get the vaccine. So you shouldn't have a uh, moral code against getting it for that reason. And as far as safety, just as Dr. Meyer said, it, it's fully safe as far as that, that aspect goes as well. Jerry is retired from KU. He's 65 years old. Hi, Jerry. Thanks for working here. Thanks for being a part of KU. <laughs> yeah. And he's had some circumstances in his family, and his son now needs a ride back and forth to work, and he wants to know, is that safe for him to do that? You know, that's a great question, mm -hmm. Hawkeye. What do you think? I think it's all about risk reduction and mitigation. It's never going to be elimination, but there are things you can do to help. Uh, yeah, reduce that. Wear a mask. Wear maybe a mask. open the window a little bit, even in cold weather, to help add a little more yeah. circulation. And make sure the driver has a mask. Yeah, understand how long that drive is. I think if both parties are wearing masks, uh, you could even maybe throw in a face shield or eye protection with with goggles as well. Those are all things to reduce mitigation. And we can always go back to that MMWR report about the the two hairstylists in Springfield and all of the uh, patients or clients that they were able to interview, they did not find any link from those hairstylists to any of those clients for uh, spreading or transmitting the disease. So if you can do that, you can reduce your risk, won't fully eliminate it, but certainly reduce it and hopefully give you um, a little bit better feeling of safety. Marcia said that she heard on the national news that asymptomatic people that are COVID positive cannot spread 
the virus. Is that true? Uh, what national news did mm -hmm. she listen to? Because that is utterly untrue. Yeah, that has been uh, untrue since pretty early in the spring, I believe. we That was one of the concerns and one of the reasons why this is so transmissible compared to SARS-CoV-1 or the original SARS, which you really weren't able to infect other people until five to seven days after symptoms. So it was easy to isolate those people on contact trace. This is so much more difficult because, number one, of the level of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people and the fact that you can spread this disease uh, one, if not two days before any symptoms uh, really peaks out, and then one to two days after is when it uh, becomes starts to become less transmissible, probably until about that seven or eight day mark. So certainly any pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic people absolutely have the ability to spread this disease. Dr. Myers, children who are asymptomatic, can they spread the disease, and can children spread the disease in general? Yeah, that's a good question. So yes, children can spread the disease, but what the data has shown thus far is that younger children are less likely to spread it than older children. And that older children, adolescents, tend to be more similar to adults' ability to spread disease. But like most respiratory viruses, it can be spread before you have symptoms. And Dr. Alt, I, I know you, you, you know a lot about vaccination in general. Where are we getting this idea that if you're asymptomatic, you can't spread it? I don't quote social media very frequently, but I think I will now. Natalie Dean was the author of a study that was uh, like that week before the Christmas holiday uh, that might have been in JAMA, but I follow her on Twitter. She's an epidemiologist at the uh, University of Florida. I think her study showed in households, you, you could look her up on Twitter. I think her study showed that uh, you were less likely to spread it in households if you were asymptomatic, but no spread is not the message. And she put out several rather emphatic tweets about that that was being misinterpreted. S symptomatic people spread it more, asymptomatic people mm -hmm. spread it less, but not zero. There's no zeros anywhere there. And it was a sub-analysis of her data. So that's always uh, suspicious when you get into much smaller groups of people. You bet. All right, Jill, one more question. Joanne says that she's hearing that healthcare people are opting out of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Is that true and why? You know, that that's a great question. Yeah. And uh, let, let's just answer it head on. Um, we, we have a uh, an uptake rate of about 70%. Yep. Uh, so about 30% of people, some of whom are, in fact, um, uh, people who are vaccine hesitant and want to see how it goes. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, Bob Page, our CEO, had forwarded um, a document that came from Vizient, uh, a big consortium of healthcare um, uh, systems around the United States. And I think there are 20 or 30 responses from different uh, leaders around the country and multiple different health systems. And they all were saying the same thing. The range of uptake is between 50 and 80 percent in healthcare systems. And the number one reason is just people wanting to see how the folks who initially got it do. Um, and then the, the and and then some people were, were saying as they've watched others get it, mm -hmm. they're beginning to want to go get it. And 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 so this is my response to this. It, it comes from Lin Manuel's Hamilton. Do not throw away your shot, <laughs> because this is incredibly important. This is how we win the game. This is how we win a pandemic. And with, when the call to arms comes to you and you say, "Not me, not yet." What it means is you're saying to the coronavirus, step in front, go ahead. So the choice is one of two. You can take your call to arms, don't throw away your shot, and begin to help us beat coronavirus, or say, corona, go ahead, take a step in front of me, come for me, come for the other ones I know and love. That's the difference, and that's the decision you have to make. Let's turn first to Angela. Final thoughts for today. Yeah, um, you know, I think there's different types of vaccine hesitancy out there. We have some healthcare workers who are truly vaccine hesitant for many different types of vaccines, but we have some who are just a little bit worried and are a little bit on the fence. And for those folks, I hope that you have a trusted person that you can talk to and ask and um, ask the questions that you have so that you hopefully will gain some comfort level in um, accepting the vaccine. Our vaccine rates are around 70% too at Children's Mercy, and I would love to see it go even higher. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thanks for being a part of the program today. And thanks again for the great work Children has done in our community, helping keep schools safe mm -hmm. to keep our community safe. Well done. Dr. Mm -hmm. Alt. 
Well, I've heard Dr. Myers give talks on that topic before, so I was interested to hear what she had to say. But I, I think you're, I, I think the 70 percent you would find for a lot of vaccines, not just in physicians, but in parents and adults who are getting vaccinated. And then there's about a 10 or 20 percent group of people that are vaccine hesitant. And so, yes, as more people get vaccinated, as more healthcare workers, you know, get vaccinated and, and talk about how minimal their symptoms were and how relieved they are to be vaccinated, I think uh, that will certainly get us up to the 80 or 90 percent uptake in healthcare workers. And where we need to be for the community in general, Hawkeye. Yeah, yeah I'd just like to thank our guests so much, our you know, pediatrics expert and our uh, vaccine and, and pregnancy expert. Um, you know, thank you very much. I think all of the points were very salient and very important. And we touched on a lot of different subjects today from schools to vaccines to uh, the multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome in children, all of those things. Certainly for the vaccines, that's an important thing. Um, you know, as now the Moderna and Pfizer companies have been ramping at production, as there are more and better uh, systems and protocols in place for getting those vaccines that are currently used uh, into the arms of the people. There will be more supply because the demand is so high right now. There'll be more supply for uh, increased and in starting the uh, vaccination on the general public. And we will certainly be ready when that happens. Uh, hopefully it will happen sooner rather than later. I think that time frame can shift a little bit, but certainly we'll be ready uh, to get that into the arms of the general public when it when we can. Yeah, it is just so important. Hey, um, tomorrow uh, we're back with Dr. Michael Rippey, a sports neurologist. I know Dr. Rippey very well. He does a great job in, in the world of post-concussion syndrome and other things. He is starting to see some long haulers with a brain fog and chronic headaches since they've had COVID-19. Dr. Rippey is going to talk with us about how he advises these patients and to let us know what he's seeing. He recently got his COVID-19 shot as well, and so we're going to be talking to him about how it's felt to be vaccinated. I think this is a really important topic. We're seeing more and more about brain fog emerging both around the time of getting COVID-19 and then even weeks later, so it'll really be an important conversation to have. Hey, New Year's holds promise, and that's why we're celebrating the first baby born here at, K uh, at KU. That celebration is a cultural main mainstay that dates back as far as ancient Greece. We want to celebrate our first baby born at the health system. Okay, now, I am not going to say this name right, and so mom and family, I apologize for this. I think it's Gisley Gisley. I'm not sure. I apologize. She was born at 3.40 a.m. My wife's an obstetrician. She's going to hate me for not being able to say that name correctly. As a male, six pounds, nine ounces. Mom's is Maria, and she's from my hometown of Independence, Missouri, and featuring some fine chief's gear out there. We love it. Congratulations to you and your family. Hey, another cultural mainstay is making a New Year's resolution. I want one of those to be for you to take command of your health. That starts with making and keeping your doctor's appointments and annual screenings, especially cancer screenings. In just a moment, you'll be seeing Dr. Jamie Wagner, who's been on our program before. She's going to share the impact of COVID-19 on cancer diagnosis. We don't want to give COVID-19 the power. How do we keep the power? You got to play offense. You got to play defense. Our defense, now that it's game on, Defense are the rules of infection control. And you've heard in this program how those can keep you safe. Whether you're at home, you're in an Uber ride, you're in a school, you're at work, you're right here in the health system where we know that the rules of infection control have protected our staff even though we've taken care of nearly 2,000 patients now with COVID. So when you think about that number and you think about the focus and the concentration of all those patients, remember, you can stay safe by following the rules of infection control. And tomorrow, Hawkeye, I got some cool masks for Christmas. I'm going to start bringing a few masks in. I think we ought to show some of the cool masks we've got. What do you think? Yeah, Let's do it. Than just the regular surgical masks. I know. We've got some really cool stuff. But We're going to start showing off our cool masks because we don't want you to think it's time to stop masking. Keep your masks on. And then let's go get your shot on. Don't throw away your opportunity. This is your call to arms to help keep us all safe. We all want to be back to normal. 
it's going to hurt my heart to look at Arrowhead Stadium in the middle of the playoffs and not see 80,000 people screaming for the Chiefs. It'll hurt my heart when we can't see 40,000 people at the K welcoming back baseball. But we can do those things soon enough. But it takes us following the rules, getting our shots, and making sure we take care of each other. And that way, we can make sure that COVID-19, that it loses this game. So we'll be back tomorrow. But first, let's hear some really important words of advice from Jamie Wagner. We are seeing about a 50% decrease in the number of diagnoses of breast cancer in the country. Then what that translates to is by the time we're finding something, unfortunately, it is probably a more advanced stage than where it would have been had it been found on that screening mammogram. It's really because as a result of COVID, us shutting down mammography for some time, as well as now that we are open, people still having a fear of coming in. Screening mammography um, improved survival by almost 40%. So that right there tells you that screen mammography, it does its job. You are um, the best self-advocate and part of that is knowing your body. We look more on doing breast self-awareness. The old school breast self exams where we used to have those shower cards and it had to be done the same way every month. It actually has shown that it doesn't improve um, identification, but just knowing your body, knowing okay. what's normal for you, even if you feel like you've got a lumpy, bumpy breast, if something is new, if you are comfortable with your body, you'll identify that. We need to set new anniversaries. <laughs> we need to set new mammography parties. Whatever it was for you, um, waiting that year until March or July comes back around, we know that that one year could make a difference. Screening saves lives and it doesn't matter what kind of cancer it is, whether it is lung, prostate, colorectal, all across the board, screening has been shown to improve outcomes for cancer survival.